Up next, Micah Hanks presents UFOs, A Historical Perspective. Welcome back, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis, and this is week four of the Streamathon emergency fundraiser series from the Anomaly Archives. We are trying to raise twenty thousand dollars, our annual budget for uh, our nonprofit five hundred one c three. It's called the Scientific Anomaly Institute, AKA the Anomaly Archives. You can find out all about us at anomalyarchives.org, as well as all of uh, these, the links to the archives of these uh, streamathons uh, that are also archived at our YouTube channel. Uh, but without further ado. Uh, Micah Hanks is a writer, podcaster, researcher, and speaker whose interests cover a variety of subjects, including history, archaeology, science, and the future of humankind. A longtime researcher and proponent of the scientific study of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UFOs, Micah has authored a number of books and has contributed many essays, articles, and blogs to various publications. Along with his podcasts, he has also worked as a narrator and lending his voice to several audiobooks, woohoo, uh, radio programs, and other recorded projects over the years. And uh, yes, he uh, has a great voice and a great mind, and, uh, and he's always constantly working on a number of interesting projects. And he's now just launched a new project that's uh, with some other great researchers called The Debrief, and I'm sure he can tell us a little bit more about that. Hey, Micah, how you doing? I am doing extremely well and, uh, of course, always hopeful that technology is going to be on our side today, uh, which ever increasingly as we move into the future, it seems to be so far, right? But, I mean, we're a long ways right now, smiles from, you know, flint napping. My other area of interest is archaeology, and that was almost foolproof technology. You know, you take a big hunk of chert and you nap it into a stone projectile and you launch that. Yeah, that's that's hard to mess up, although there was incredible intricacy to it. But, yeah, computers, totally different thing. So let's, let's hope for the best today, yeah? Fingers crossed, man. <laughs> Yes. And how are you, by the way, I should ask? Doing great. Um, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we're still uh, slowly progressing towards our goal, but uh, we have a long way to go. But um, And we're still on the hunt for a new location. So as I've said, folks can email contact at anomalyarchives.org if you've got uh, leads on good locations here in Austin. So 
and it's beautiful outside. I have I see some beautiful fall colors out my window, so I'm I'm very happy. So. Excellent. And I'm yeah. here with you, man. <laughs> well, hey, look, there's no better place to be. And uh, if I may, actually, you know, I'm I'm going to save it for when we get into the talk because. As uh, you know, you know, and a lot of folks at home who might be uh, aware of the schedule today, I'm going to be talking about the history of one of our favorite topics, UFOs, which is a subject near and dear to a lot of the fine folks who have been presenters. Aaron Gould, yes, my good pal who just spoke. In fact, again, this is something that uh, I know that he certainly appreciates and enjoys, and we both like to geek out about this. But um, what the Anomaly Archives is involved with and what you guys not only have done for a long time, but what we all hope you'll continue to be able to do for years to come. It has everything to do with history. And so I'll have a little more to say about that later. Really appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much for, for everything you've done for us so far. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just always amazed at, 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 you're one of the hardest people working in this field that I, that I know. And you've always got uh, uh, your, a lot of things, a lot of plates spinning, or a lot of things on different burners, as they say. And uh, uh, what's? Can you tell us briefly about the the uh, briefly about the new uh, uh, website? The is it debrief.org? Yeah, right? yeah, the debrief.org uh, with a the added. But uh, yes, the debrief. It's funny because I mean, it initially had been an idea uh, that came to mind for me personally with regard to all the developments we have kind of seen in the last few years with regard to UFOs, but also again, with a mind for history, trying to uh, raise the bar on the kind of discussion that I think uh, can and should be had about that topic. But uh, my wonderful uh, colleagues who I've launched this with MJ Benias and Tim McMillan um, are very much of the mind and were really instrumental in, as they came on board, Tim again, really had been there since the outset, but as this idea kind of evolved and went through different stages over the last several months, it became increasingly apparent that really, if we want to have a serious conversation about UFOs, it might be helpful to bring that conversation out of the realm that's exclusive to that subject. You know, again, and I have to admit, I'm one of those people, really, uh, who for a long time, you know, we UFO researchers or UFO uh, advocates, zealots, you know, pick whatever term you want for it. But again, people who are passionate about this subject, we guard it jealously. Uh, we almost are protective at times. Actually, I think we're very protective because it's something that's meaningful to us. But I think that really anyone who really studies this deeply begins to see also that it's deeply meaningful in the broader scope of a lot of things that we're seeing right now. And even if you're one of the harsh UFO skeptics and you don't think that there's a literal phenomenon behind it. I don't happen to be one of those personally, but if you were, I would nonetheless argue, look, there are things that we can learn about ourselves and maybe also about space and whether we're alone in the universe from the way that we approach how we try to understand and reconcile with this topic. So I think there's something of benefit to everybody in terms of the study of UFOs, but in order to broader that discussion, in order really to give it the kind of, you know, intellectual and societal even framework and definitely historical that it deserves, it's got to be put into the context of what the regular sciences deal with. It's also got to be put into the context of this is a subject that should be treated like other sciences. Science should be applied to it. And indeed, if it is what many think it does represent, a possible technology in our midst, which we can't account for, it could also be paradigm shifting in the sense of Thomas Kuhn and scientific revolu uh, revolutions. You know, I mean, this could be a paradigm shifting discovery that might establish all new branches of scientific inquiry. So, yeah, it's incumbent upon us to move this dialogue over into an area where it can get more attention and more people are discussing it in the context of science, technology and even national defense. That's what the debrief is all about. And we don't just talk about UFOs, but again, it's been a wild ride and I, you know, have enjoyed every moment of it, all the work that's gone in. So <laughs> good to take a minute off though, and be here with you guys. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, let's, uh, without further ado, let's get your slides up and let you, uh, go, go into this, uh, overview of the history of the UFO. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, again, we, we ran a, uh, test the other night, so we'll give it a shot and see how this goes. Hopefully we should be able to do this pretty quickly here. Uh, okay. Let me see here. Smiles. Let's try this. We're going to share the screen and I'm going to go full screen here and let me know if you can see us. How are we looking? I think we're ready to go. All right. We'll try that. So uh, UFOs, a historical perspective. You know, uh, my friend and colleague Smiles had proposed initially the kind of working title for this had been um, pre-1947 UFOs. And we're certainly going to be looking at a lot of a lot of those today. But 
uh, as time allows. Although if possible, I'd like to also offer a little time at the end for kind of you know wrap up and, and questions if there are any for our live YouTube audience and hello everyone at home. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, UFOs, the possibility that there is evidence for what we might call the human experience that we recognize today as the UFO encounter. Um, similar experiences throughout history going all the way back to antiquity. But I want to add a few caveats about what exactly a UFO experience is, what that really means, and importantly, how we scientifically and in a historical context, how we study them, how we actually best implement uh, scientific protocols and also responsible historical research when we're looking at UFOs. But before we get into all that, uh, I, as promised, I do want to mention that uh, on the note of history, it's very important what the Anomaly Archives does. Um, over the years, I have had a lot of friends, uh, many of them who have been in this decades longer than me and most of us here, uh, people who have devoted their entire lives really to the study of phenomena like UAP or UFOs uh, and other uh, interesting topics. Another one that I'm passionate about and I certainly enjoy is cryptozoology. Um, you know, again, take your pick, but there have been incredible efforts made to document these sorts of phenomena. And uh, what is tragic truly to me is when information that people have spent their lives documenting is lost. And it's not something we can afford to lose, especially if we understand, as I was saying there at the outset, the importance of being able to apply scientific protocols toward the understanding of phenomena like UFOs and these sorts of things. Um, I, a number of years ago, actually was at an event where I was speaking and I uh, was chatting with a guy who had been a former scientific advisor to the Joint Chiefs and uh, had said, you know, after my experience in government advising the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, I think less science involved in this field is going to be beneficial. And I said, you were a science advisor. Why would you say that? And he said, because I didn't see any progress with science. And so, you know, I challenged him on that. I said, you know, I disagree. And he said, listen, let me say again, I was a science advisor to the Joint Chiefs, okay? And, uh, you know, I have some experience in this. And I said, yeah, but with full respect to that, I don't think that the problem that you saw warrants less scientific involvement. And I said, what I think we need is we need a better scientific approach and we need more people willing to apply that science. And it troubles me that there are people who, again, he wasn't necessarily someone who had spent his life studying UFOs. He had been someone who had been in the sciences, came to learn about this phenomena, and then was so disgusted by the way that he had seen the establishment treat the subject, he wanted nothing to do with it. And I thought, you know, there's nothing next to that more tragic, of course, than the loss of knowledge. And so when we try to document the history of a phenomenon, very much like the Anomaly Archives does, you know, documenting all kinds of things, preserving historical records, collections, personal collections, you know, people's actual uh, personal book collections, their files, their own original research, you know, these kinds of things. That information, if it can be preserved, it can be useful to future decades. Maybe future scientists who are more open-minded or who have had less exposure to an establishment worldview that prevents them from really seeing the benefit of and the merit of the study of these kinds of topics. And if we can preserve that information right now, if we can do what the Anomaly Archives, if it can continue, as I know it will, if we can preserve the information in the way that they are doing, maybe there will be future generations that will be able to do even more with what we're collecting and learning about today than we've been able to do. That's my hope, at least. And so before we really get into this lecture, I really implore people at home, if you have not yet, uh, please consider supporting this endeavor. Please donate to the Anomaly Archives here with the Streamathon. Smiles and the gang have uh, very graciously uh, given of themselves, given incredible amounts of free content. And they've gotten other people, including myself, Aaron before me, and all kinds of other folks who have been contributors, um, you know, who have given our time. Uh, please consider supporting this effort because, again, it really may mean great importance to our own future and those who come well after us. If we are able to take that action today, it really means a lot. All right. So without further ado, we're going to get into things here. UFOs, a historical perspective, very much in line with what we're talking about. Why apply history to a subject that seems very, well, really, for lack of a better term, futuristic? Because if anything, UFOs seem to represent a technology the likes of which we see in, you know, sci-fi films or read about in comic books and play in video games and things like that. 
But the reason I think we have to apply historical research to this, and the reason it has become so important to me in recent months, years, in fact, is because with, for instance, the groundbreaking revelations that have occurred since 2017, that was the big New York Times article co-authored by Leslie Kane, a veteran UFO reporter and commentator, also Ralph Blumenthal, and then also uh, Helene Cooper, uh, who uh, covers Pentagon as, you know, her normal beat for the New York Times. But here you have these, uh, you know, very credentialed reporters and also someone who has made great strides in reporting on UFOs over the years coming together and going into print in a paper of record like the New York Times and publishing a story that revealed a few things. One, our government and the Department of Defense is looking at UFOs and they seem to take that seriously. Two, the name of that program, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Keywords there, threat identification. Is there any overt evidence that the UFO phenomenon is threatening? No, no, there's not, fortunately. But any significantly advanced technology that we can't account for must be treated in the context of national security as a potential threat. And I think that was one of the big takeaways that we've got guys like Lou Elizondo and others who are looking at this. And in fact, right now are still looking at this, something my colleagues and I have reported on recently there at thedebrief.org. And then, of course, the other big takeaway is that whatever this phenomena is, whatever the apparent technology that our Navy has used technology like Raytheon's uh, at FLIR forward targeting pod in order to actually capture and track and obtain other instrumental data about, whatever this technology is, we don't know what it is. And this, of course, was followed by subsequent reporting. But really, again, what was of tremendous significance to me had been the fact that earlier this year, April of 2020, a year of reckoning, you know, I'm still waiting for the actual zombie apocalypse. And certainly with the pandemic underway, it has actually felt at times like a real alien invasion. So this has been a year I think many of us will remember for decades to come. But in all uh, or rather in of all years, it makes very uh, much sense to me that we would have the Pentagon coming out and disclosing officially these three videos, which had already been leaked online previously. And their official statement is, we class the phenomena in these videos as unidentified. We apparently don't know what it is, in other words. Uh, and yet it was really kind of met with very little fanfare. I mean, such a momentous occasion. The DOD comes out and officially acknowledges in a, in a press release posted on their website, we've got videos of things, a technology apparently that we can't identify. And people are like, huh, that's interesting. You know, let's go over here and look at cat videos. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe that's the strangest thing about 2020, that we would have such a big announcement. And, and really, it wasn't as impactful. And my colleague, John Greenwald, and I both went on Coast to Coast AM the weekend after the news was posted. And we, you know, had a, well, an all night conversation. If you're one of those late night listeners, you know how late Coast goes. And so we're on there, we're talking about that and the implications. And it baffled me then, as it does now, that... Again, people aren't as mystified by this as I think I am, even though I've spent my you know better part of my adult life studying this. And so it's really begun to make me think, well, what is going on here and why do people react to the subject the way that they do? And one thing you'll often see, the sorts of, I think, uh, you know, mainstream scientists that the gentleman I spoke of earlier had been so frustrated with during his uh, his own experience and his actual um, career as, a, as an advisor to the Joint Chiefs had talked about. You know, we see those kinds of establishment scientists looking at these videos and going, look, that's our own technology. Our boys out there at Area 51, they cook this stuff up. That's all this is. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, well, again, if we look at the history of the phenomenon, is that necessarily the most likely, the most parsimonious statement or explanation for what we appear to be looking at here? I don't think it is, because again, on further review of the history, we know that at least going back to 1947, there seems to be a plethora of information very much in keeping with, in other words, anecdotal reports, but sometimes also uh, captured with instrumental data in support of them, namely radar, that seem to talk about the very same sorts of things that we are now seeing in these, uh, you know, highly sophisticated um pieces of imagery, I would say. I mean, they are videos, but it's a lot more than just a video because we also have all sorts of tracking capability, heat signatures, you know, other information that's being obtained with this technology. And so I think that if people today uh, who are making statements like that, that's just our own stuff. We probably cooked it up out there at Area 51. And if not, it's Russia's or China's, which again is a tremendously disturbing 
concept, in my opinion. But if people who made those kinds of offhand statements had studied the history, I don't think that they would be so quick to make those kinds of claims. And hence why we're going to look at the history today. But if I, th and I really think that even further back than 1947, as we will demonstrate, um, there is some evidence suggestive of the idea that a phenomena uh, may have been present and that, in fact, within the context of people's uh, ideological framework and using the parlance of the day, people spoke about these things that are nonetheless relatable to us today. So we'll get into things here if I can find the right button to push. I'd like to uh, lead off with this quote by the veteran researcher Barry Greenwood, uh, who, if you aren't familiar with his UFO historical review, it's a fantastic publication, and uh, I think all of them can be read online in PDF format there at the Greenwood Archive website. Go online, look for UFO Greenwood Archive or Greenwood UFO Archive. That'll get you to his website, and then you can scroll down in the column on the left-hand side to the UFO Historical Review, only one of the many publications he produced over the years. But in that first edition, there was actually episode zero that came out first as a test, and then he put out the first one, the full first full-length edition of the newsletter. But in that first full-length edition, he had this quote, to understand how any topic functions, one must understand the topic's origins, that from which it came. UFOs have a very deep but very obscure base which through the years has been twisted, molded, and manipulated to meet the needs of whoever had a belief to promote. Now, that seems like a rather skeptical statement, and it is, and I think that it really should be kept in mind that unfortunately many people who have looked at the potential that there is a deeper history of this subject, they often will kind of take that and say, therefore, you know, all the religious experiences that we read about in religious texts from over the years, these must be aliens. Uh, you know, we can look at cave art that seems to depict incredible, extraordinary beings that quite obviously are not human, therefore aliens. I think we should slow our roll to use a technical term. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, often there is actually ample evidence that suggests that things that people have looked at in the archaeological record said, you know, this could be UFO or this could be alien evidence, actually may be something entirely different. Some things are, uh, you know, based on religious visions. Some things uh, may be religious visions that were chemically induced, you know, with substances like psilocybin, if they were taking what we colloquially known today as magic mushrooms. I think there's a very strong case, especially when you got figures like the character on the cave walls at Tassili in Algeria, where some, again, we might use the expression ancient astronaut theorists would say spaceman. I look at a guy, a human, an anthropomorphic figure with little mushrooms growing all over his body, and I'm thinking, that's probably actually a you know a good trip or a bad one, depending on how you see it, uh, on on mushrooms, you know, by a, effectively a caveman who later represented what he saw on a cave wall. Um, there are also the possibilities, though, that some of these ancient epics, like the Vedas of ancient India and the like, uh, maybe some of these are also just imaginary. Again, I wonder if future anthropologists will look back at our UFO commentaries of today, or maybe more importantly, our science fiction of today. You know, the things that we have clearly written simply as science fiction novels. You know, if they read Stephen King novels or Arthur C. Clarke, are they going to look back at that and say, was this evidence of astronauts visiting, right? Uh, it's very possible that people in the ancient world, again, you know, modern Homo sapiens sapiens, human beings just like us, anatomically indistinguishable from modern people, I don't doubt they had the same faculties for imagination. So we should certainly be very careful when we look at evidence presented in the past and try to say, therefore, aliens. But I think if we are careful and discerning, we certainly may find evidence of very similar UFO-like phenomena in the past, which may help us place the UFO phenomena as we know it today into the proper historical context. Um, again, this statement that I lead off here, my own, our tendency to ponder over unidentified aerial phenomena is a time-honored tradition. And as I note, yes, you know, you look back at historical documents and you do see uh, religious texts, philo uh, philosophical tracts, you know, broadsheets, especially from just a few centuries ago that seem to show things that are very similar to what we would call UFOs today. Are they really? Uh, you know, something I also notice, and this is something of, of a paradox to me, the majority of the written literature that addresses the history of UFOs today starts in 1947 or thereabouts. Some may go back as far as 45 or 1943, but the majority of the books that are written on this topic, they start in the 1940s. 
And, uh, you know, the authors, and many of them are great authors, authors I highly respect, but they'll say, you know, there is, uh, well, I should say they will acknowledge, rather, that there is probably a deeper history of this phenomena. But, you know, there's only so much that we can learn from studying it, you know, and, and really, apart from the things that we can look at in the modern era, what may be UFOs from earlier times, you know, they really are nothing more than good stories and will best be served by starting in, starting in 1947 and moving forward. I can't help but wonder, really, is that necessarily true? Now, I've already kind of touched on what historical ufology, in my opinion, is. And just to kind of clarify, it is not to try and find evidence of extraterrestrial visitation since ancient times, per se. It is rather trying to recognize whether experiences very similar to the modern human experience of looking up into the sky, seeing a phenomenon we can't identify, you know, ascribing agency to it and projecting our own ideas onto what it may be, which in truth, we still have not reached any kind of conclusions, let alone a consensus on what UFOs might represent and what their origins may be. But I think that that experience of looking up in the sky and saying, what is that? That's been with us since time immemorial. And really, I think that that's the best way that we can kind of frame the idea of historical ufology. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not trying to find proof of ancient astronauts necessarily, nor is it necessarily saying that aliens exist. It would be hard to look into the ancient past and look at historical records of experiences similar to our modern UFO experience and say that that somehow proves the visitation of extraterrestrials has been occurring since time immemorial. I mean, some people do say that. Personally, I think we would need more evidence. I think most modern scientists would say, uh, say so also. Um, I also don't think that this necessarily means that UFOs all have natural sources. Some scientists might even acknowledge that there were UFO-like experiences going way back further into history. And they would say, obviously, predating the modern scientific era, what this must mean is that, well, natural phenomena causes UFOs, and that indeed, Hynek was not incorrect when he said swamp gas that time got him in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think that that necessarily is a conclusion that can be drawn from this either. Um, again, I've got a lot of friends and colleagues who are very interested in, in fact, many of them are actually religious studies professors or people who have written on religious studies from various world religions. They uh, inevitably uh, look at the UFO phenomena as something that can best be explained as religious visions. And although I will maintain that indeed many UFO-like experiences from antiquity, even up through maybe the 19th century, sound very much like and probably are equate, you know, or, or, or they would equate to being uh, religious experiences. I don't know that that is the best explanation for all UFO experiences or that that is necessarily the sum total of what the phenomena may be. So again, when we're talking about historical ufology, I just want to make sure that we're careful about what we say it is, but we're really clear about what we say it is not. And in his seminal work, Anatomy of a Phenomenon, Dr. Jacques Vallée, who some of you guys, by the way, may have seen recently on the Joe Rogan podcast with filmmaker James Fox, of course, uh, who, whose recent film, The Phenomenon, I think also does a fine job presenting the history of the phenomena. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And also shout out to Joe Rowe, because right there, I think in the first five minutes, they were mentioning the debrief and an article that we had published, even though they didn't say the debrief, but they were certainly talking about one of our stories. And so that was uh, certainly flattering. Um, but uh, it was even more important to me to see Jacques Vallée sitting there in the studio with Joe talking with him, uh, one of the world's most popular podcasts. And here's a man who um, I know both from having watched him do it, but also having corresponded only a little with him. I know that Vallée likes to keep basically, you know, out of the limelight anymore. Uh, he has a lot of frustrations with the, I think, the hype that is put behind the UFO subject these days. And really, if you read his journals, which he published years ago under the title Forbidden Science, uh, he uh, has always been frustrated with these kinds of things and thought that really people need to spend less time on stage talking about this stuff and more time in the lab studying it. But how do you study something that you can't grab? I can't just reach up and grab a UFO, bring it into the laboratory, you know, put it under a microscope and look at it. That's a tremendous problem, is it not? I think Valet recognized this problem, and maybe today still does, better than most. And in that first significant scientific work written by a, a scientist, but 
significantly. His work, his book, Anatomy of a Phenomenon, was one of the first major books on the subject, written from a scientific perspective, but one which was in advocacy of the idea that there was a phenomenon. There had been, prior to this, Donald Menzel's book, I think a world of UFOs. He'd written a couple of them, co-authored um, with a with a uh, uh, another. Uh, his co-author, her name was Lyle, or oh, her last name uh, slips my mind. But the name you wouldn't guess that his co-author and ghostwriter was a female, uh, which was rather interesting for its era. Nonetheless, though, um, Lyle and Dr. Menzel's books they took the typical scientific approach toward this. They were very dismissive of the UFO phenomenon. And Valet's book was kind of a counterpoint to that, also by a scientist, but very much an advocacy of the phenomena. And I think he said it best right there from the outset. The phenomenon under study is not the UFO, which is not reproducible at will in the laboratory, but the report written by the witness. This report can be observed, studied, and communicated by professional scientists. Thus defined, the phenomenon we investigate is obviously real. Again, the UFO observation, in other words, or as he phrases it, the report written by the witness. Our problem, therefore, he concludes, is no longer to explain, but to analyze. Well, now he was saying that about scientific approaches towards studying UFOs. Again, bring that over into the historical context. What do we do when we go back through antiquity and we read what people have said that they've seen since time immemorial? Well, we look at the report written by the witnesses, don't we? And that's what we shall do over the course of this conversation. Now, a gentleman who, the late Richard B. Stuthers, uh, who has really fascinated me uh, for the work that he has done. Stuthers, uh, formerly of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, wrote a very interesting paper that looked at the possibility that UFOs might have been observed in classical antiquity, of which he said, if no, or rather, if more information were available to us, we would perhaps find that conventional scientific hypotheses could explain most, if not all of these classical reports. But as he contended, and this has been echoed by others, the late William R. Corliss had been one, uh, many others too. Uh, he says, nonetheless, there remains a small residue of puzzling accounts. And regardless of what interpretation one places on them, these constitute a phenomenon that spans centuries of time and widely different cultures. So again, what Stuthers is saying here, let's break this down for just a moment because there's a bit to uh, unpack here. As he notes, even though we can probably explain most of these, no matter, he says, what interpretation one places on them, this phenomena that we recognize in which Valet had said very much was the report of the UFO, that thing which we can actually study, we can analyze, right? Stuthers is saying the same thing. The aspect of the phenomena that we can study certainly exists, and there is a historical record of it. Let's look at some examples. One of my favorites that he provides is 217 BC, this, during the Second Punic War. And we have the report given to us by Livy uh, of fiery globes. And the translation, again, keep in mind that, uh, that Stothers was a classical scholar. Wonderful to know that there were classical scholars working with NASA who also were interested in UFOs and whether they've been around for a long time. But the brief quote here, at Capena, two moons rose in the daytime. And at Capua, a kind of moon fell during a rainstorm. Now. That could possibly be anything, but Stuthers gives us a bit of a breakdown. The Kapuan moon may have, it sounds almost like something from the Mandalorian, doesn't it? That Kapuan moon, right? But he says this moon may have been a manifestation of ball lightning, but the two moons at Capena most likely were not. Mock moons, as they are known, are seen only at night when the real moon is very bright, but a bolide seen together with the real moon in the daytime or a bolide split in two is a possibility. Um, Again, if you go online and you search for uh, UFOs in historical antiquity, Richard B. Stuthers, you can read this entire thing for free online. I highly recommend that you do. And uh, it's only one, this account that we feature from Stuthers' paper is just one account. Uh, but again, Jacques Vallée, who we mentioned earlier, co-authored a book uh, with uh, Chris Albeck a number of years ago, which I'm sure many uh, folks watching at home will be familiar with. And that, of course, is Wonders in the Sky. Uh, yes, as some scholars have pointed out, you know, there are some issues with some of the translations and a few other minor details throughout that book. And this actually inspired Albeck and Valet to produce a second lengthier uh, updated version of the book, which is a little more expensive, but also it was quite a lot to produce, as I understand, too. And uh, I would highly recommend uh, that people who are interested in this phenomena look at that book. But you'll notice immediately, as I did, if, if you actually trudge through it, it takes quite a great amount of uh, constitution in order to do because they present 
uh, 500 accounts that they think prior to the 19th century bolster the case for the UFO experience throughout time. But, you know, some of the critics who have uh, taken issue with the book, I think, have completely missed the point. If you know what Valet is trying to do when he's studying UFOs, of course, a person who throughout his life has been an advocate of the idea that there is a phenomenon. But if you look at the statement from Anatomy of a Phenomenon and the way that he tries to say we should go about looking at it, if you look at the similar perspective that Stuthers and others have taken, Stuthers and others, that was an un unintentional rhyme. I guess that makes me a poet, even though I didn't know it. But if you take these things into consideration, it certainly bespeaks the idea that what Valet and Albeck are trying to say is, yet again, as I've argued, here is an experience that people have seem seemingly had throughout time where they look into the sky and they see things they can't explain. Were some of them meteors? Were some of them, you know, again, what is referred to here, ball lightning, you know, uh, mock moons, parhelion, sun dogs, you know, astronomical or simply atmospheric phenomena that might give the appearance of lights in the sky where they don't belong? Certainly. Maybe, as Stuthers said, a majority of them could be explained in that way. But are they all necessarily that? And again, Chris Albeck, uh, a fantastic researcher, wrote a equally fantastic book called Return to Magonia, uh, which looks at UFO accounts from antiquity, but it also in, brings in modern astronomical software and things in an effort to try and determine if some of these classical accounts can be solved. And some of them can. And Albeck will be the first to tell you that. But there are still others, as uh, Stuthers correctly predicted, that that residuum that seemed to be less easily explained. Another interesting one, to, uh, uh, you know, as far as my favorites, you might say, and this one, which we have a visual of as well, dates to 1479, uh, the Arabian rocket, as it's known. Uh, and the general description is of an aerial object described in the original text as a comet. Uh, it appeared with a sharpened front portion. It had features that included a protrusion resembling a scythe, which was said to have been observed over Arabia. And of course, I give the uh, the source uh, from uh, Conrad Lycosthenes, published in 1557, uh, which dated the the actual observation to 1497. But this is the image that was uh, included in Ly uh, Lycosthenes' actual writing about this and the original Latin. Uh, what's particularly interesting about this to me is what it is quite obviously a scythe right there, just like, you know, the Grim Reaper might be seen carrying or, you know, the farming tool from ages past. You can quite evidently see a scythe running along the edge of what we in our modern eyes, again, most would look at this and say it's obviously a rocket, right? But I think where we have to be really careful is, you know, projecting onto imagery from centuries ago, our modern space age ideas. Um, is this indeed a rocket that is depicted in this wood cutting? Probably. I doubt it. I strongly doubt it. And of course, if we take into consideration uh, the imagery involving blades, sickles, scythes, swords appearing in the sky, that may be a clue because often when meteors or comets appeared in the sky, they were described in literature as you know appearing like a long sword in the heavens. So it very well may be that this uh, depiction of a what again appears to us very much in the technological world of today in this era of elon musk and spacex like a rocket flying through the clouds it very well may be something else but i think that we certainly have a clue in terms of the symbolism that the scythe and its prevalence in that image may provide um i have seen um many people especially in recent years talking about the fact that columbus purportedly saw a ufo well is that really true i'll tell you this he certainly saw a light but what was the light is this another famous historical case that maybe we can solve? Now, what we do know is that actually in his uh, in his personal journal, but it was uh, published thereafter, I actually have the source there, Ferdinand Columbus's Vita del uh, Amiraglio, uh, The Life of the Admiral. This actually features this account from Columbus where he, as they're approaching landfall at Guanahanae, okay, in the night or the early morning, rather, Columbus says that he sees what he said resembled a little wax candle off in the distance. And so he actually brings this to the attention of a couple of his shipmates there, Pedro Gutierrez and Rodrigo Sanchez de Segovia. One of them saw it, the other did not. But there was additional witness co corroboration uh, that, along with Columbus, said that they saw this little light out there in the distance. And for some reason, many people have uh, looked at this as being one of history's earliest UFO sightings. Is it necessarily? I would argue it probably is not. Uh, again, the way that 
Columbus described it. He said it looked like a little wax candle. Uh, perhaps the likeliest explanation is that it was either a torch being carried or maybe it was actually a fire on one of the neighboring islands uh, that was inhabited by the, uh, the native Taino. But uh, yes, Columbus certainly did see a light. But again, this is an important one to look at because although there was a mysterious light certainly seen and it was certainly recorded and there is in the historical record a actual testament to that experience having happened and it, a multiple witness sighting of this mysterious light, um, because I think that it is a historical mystery involving some sort of illumination, many UFO advocates have kind of gravitated toward it and said, therefore, aliens, right? Kind of talking about what we were saying earlier, we should be very careful and discerning in what we interpret to be possible evidence of UFOs. And in this instance, there isn't really much evidence that this light was ever really seen above the horizon. Even if it did appear in the sky, there may be things that would account for that. Um this is a far more interesting historical account, in my opinion, though, and we now look at John Winthrop's journal, The History of New England, from 1630 to 1649. There are a couple of very interesting accounts that Winthrop gives, uh, gives us from around 1639. This first one from the Muddy River, and this is maybe one of my very favorites, and I'll just read briefly from the description in my notes here. John Winthrop gives an account of James Everill and two other men's encounter with an unusual light. And this is the actual account from his journal. In this year, one James Everill, a sober, discreet man, and two others, saw a great light in the night at Muddy River. When it stood still, it flamed up and was about three yards square. When it ran, and this is most strange, by the way, the description he gives, but he said it was contracted into the figure of a swine. It ran as swift as an arrow towards Charlton, and so up and down about two or three hours. They were come down in their lighter about a mile, and when it was over, they, again, the boatmen, found themselves carried quite back against the tide to the place they came from. Diverse other credible persons saw the same light after about the same time. Now, I wouldn't be the first to notice that, again, there are some very unique phenomena being described here. The description of the swine is strange, uh, but perhaps most significant is the fact that the men who observed the light seemed to feel that they had found themselves further back up the stream than they had thought that they were. And uh, some have likened this very much to sort of, uh, you might call them artifacts of missing time, or again, what is purportedly the abduction experience uh, is recognized in modern UFO research. Now, is that what happened here? We can't say that. But again, fundamentally, I think it's important to recognize that similarity. Um, as I briefly touched on talking with Smiles earlier, you know, anthropology and archaeology are two of my great passions. And of, of course, you know, some of you guys out there may be familiar with the Seven Ages Research Associates, which is another project I'm involved with. You can see that at sevenages.org. But my uh, colleagues, Jason Pentrail and James Waldo and I, you know, primarily look at Native American archaeology in North America. And of course, we're fascinated, uh, fascinated with stuff all around the world. Um, <clears throat> but I think that what's really interesting is that if you look in ethnological literature and you read, for instance, in the, the journals of ethnology and the journals of American folklore and things from over the last several decades, which can be read online at jstore.org, I've found very similar accounts in indigenous American traditions that describe people who had gone out on a hunt and they find themselves up in a tree and they have no recollection of how they got into the tree, but they wake up in the branches in a tree or something along those lines. So these kinds of strange missing time-like experiences do turn up from time to time. Perhaps this is one such instance. Um, another that comes to us from Winthrop's journal. This one also very interesting. Uh, January 18th, 1664 is the date of the journal, or 1644 was the date of the journal entry. This time, an observation made near Boston Harbor there near Massachusetts, uh, where, or at Massachusetts, where John Winthrop gives the following account of lights that had been seen coming up out of the harbor. And he said, about midnight, three men coming in a boat to Boston saw two lights arise out of the water near the north point of the town cove. He says this time, rather than a swine, in the form like a man, and went at a small distance to the town, and so to the south point, and there vanished away. They saw them about a quarter of an hour, being between the town and the governor's garden. The like was seen by many, a week after arising about Castle Island, and in one-fifth of an hour came to John Gallup's point. Now, what's really interesting about this one is, again, we seem to see over time several observations of lights rising up out of the harbor. Now, Winthrop, in his journal, gave further suppositions about what might account for the sightings. And there had been a shipwreck, essentially, where a man had died. 
Winthrop and others had thought that perhaps the lights were the presence of the man's spirit, which yet again gives us, through the lens of a cultural interpretation, one reason why people might have ascribed a human-like form to the light. But of course, what really interests me is the fact that the phenomena known as UFOs, lights being seen coming out of, going into water, being seen below water, that is by no means a new phenomenon, and it's certainly something that has apparently come to the attention of the current Pentagon efforts to study UFOs, i.e. the UAP task force. And uh, my colleague Tim McMillan in his article there at our site, thedebrief.org, touched on the fact that USOs, or these underwater UFOs, seem to be a, a primary interest right now, and something that I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about in weeks and months to come. But it very well may be that uh, Winthrop gives us here from 1644 a sighting of effectively what we, what, we might, uh, what we could at least call a USO or a what appears to be a UFO arriving out of the water uh, over Boston Harbor. <clears throat> now, uh, fairly, you know, actually, it's about time. It would be apropos, I think, it being a Saturday for a little scotch, don't you? One must wet the proverbial whistle from time to time. Now. The 1890s airships are going to be pretty well known to most people who have looked at the history of this phenomenon. And I'll call back to uh, David M. Jacobs' book, The UFO Controversy in America. This was the first serious historical look at the phenomenon. Um, although there have been a lot of people who have written about the history of UFOs. Again, Lauren Denault's book, Mysteries of the Skies, was an earlier history. And there's significantly also tried to look at pre-1947 UFOs, one of the first books that really uh, committed to doing that. Um, I obtained a copy from my dear friend, Beth Arzi, a fantastic musician based in uh, South London. But uh, if we look again back at the history of the subject, you do see that there have been many commentators who have talked about the airship component. And David M. Jacobs in his book certainly did. He actually begins in the first chapter with the 1890s airships, and then he skips all the way ahead to 1947 and picks up the narrative there. And that's always been interesting to me. And we'll talk more about these other you know, kinds of sightings that occurred in what I call that ufological dark ages, because many historians of the subject, with all respect to David Jacobs and others who have you know, chronicled that history, you know, many have seemingly overstepped from the airships to 1947 as though there were no UFO sightings during that period. I think quite the contrary, there certainly were, but we had a significant wave of sightings that occurred uh, between 1896 and 1897. And as an example of that wave, I give this newspaper clipping. Again, I'm a, I'm a newspaper hound. I love to get on newspapers.com and search for old articles. And, you know, the world of history has really opened up to armchair researchers, even though I love spending a lot of time in the field. Some of the best research, you don't have to leave your office to be able to do it. And I love spending hours digging through old newspaper archives and finding accounts like this one. Significant because the engineer, this conductor of this uh, rail line, uh, who was uh, quoted in this article, uh, Captain Jim Hooten, actually provided a sketch of the uh, alleged landed airship. Now, the thing we have to keep in mind, and the reason I find this significant is because we had here a character who, again, um, I have found references to Captain Jim and other newspaper articles from the era. Uh, the rail line that he worked for actually existed. Um, many of the stories from around the 1896-1897 airship wave are quite obviously newspaper hoaxes that were kind of cashing in on the popularity of these stories. Unfortunately, there are many modern researchers who have tried to make the argument that therefore all of them were probably newspaper hoaxes. That or mass hysteria or something similar. But Perhaps to the contrary, I think that if you really are careful and, and discerning in how you look at some of the cases, there is at least the implication. Now, for all we know, Captain Hooten here might just have been pulling our leg. It could be that he was part of the uh, he, he thought maybe that it was all a, a joke and in good fun and he wanted to get in on it. That's very possible. Nonetheless, though, I think that we have at very least a stronger case when we have a person to whom the quotes can be attributed and we can find evidence that this person might have existed. And, of course, that he seems to have drawn a representation of the landed craft that he claimed to have encountered, the occupants of which he saw and which he actually went up and spoke to. Now, does that prove that there was some sort of nascent technology that appeared in the 1890s and that there were actual airships being flown around? No, it doesn't necessarily. But there has been some very interesting historical research done 
looking at this period in history, you know, looking at whether there was perhaps an actual technology behind some of the reports, um, Thomas Eddy Bullard, of course, uh, has done incredible research into this and spent a lot of time back in the day chronicling these newspaper reports before these newspapers were archived online and one could log on and pay five bucks a month and read to their heart's content. Now, he traveled around the country reading and digging for these kinds of reports. And again, I think that uh, Dr. Bullard would, like many, say that really the best we can say is that whatever the airships of the 1890s constituted, they were a cultural predecessor to the modern UFO phenomena as we recognize it today. But it's interesting sometimes, I think, and if we're going to step over into the realm of speculation here for a moment, it is interesting sometimes to think, you know, what if the UFO phenomena is unlike what most of us take it to be, i.e., you know, visitation to Earth by extraterrestrials or something like that? Wouldn't it be interesting if looking throughout history, the phenomenon seems to change and maybe even improve and become more technologically sophisticated over time? Interestingly, one perspective on historical accounts for those who dig deeply enough uh, does seem to sort of suggest that sort of trend that the phenomena itself actually is progressing, even as we are observing it over time. And even though it's always a few steps ahead of us, the noted changes that historians of this subject have seen does somewhat bespeak the idea that maybe the technology isn't so far ahead of us as many would contend. Now, again, that's just speculation, but it's interesting sometimes to entertain ideas like that. Um, we're kind of getting close to the to the primary lecture here, um, and I do want to leave a little time for open discussion here at the end if we have any, um, and also, of course, uh, questions if there are some. But um, I'll kind of leave as far as the, the actual reports that we discuss here. There's one more I do want to touch on, which I don't think I have a slide here for at the moment. But as far as pre-1947 UFOs, and actually to borrow that term that Smiles Lewis had used as the working title for this lecture, um, we're talking about, again, in the years immediately prior to 1947, and, and significantly, I think, also around the same time as, or maybe even before, you know, the Foo Fighters of the Second World War are really coming to our attention. And yet again, Barry Greenwood gives us this excellent example. Uh, on April 5th, 1943, at 9.50 a.m., Jerry Casey, an aviation writer and flight instructor, and he has actually a student flying with him at the time in a BT-13A uh, trainer. They see a strange, what again, for lack of any better term, and as I mentioned earlier, using the parlance of their day, right, what they knew to exist, if there's a what appears to be an object, an aircraft flying, I mean, it's a plane, right? So they say this weird plane was observed over Long Beach, California. But now listen to how they describe this plane. It was brought to his attention once he sees a kind of peculiar flash out of the corner of his eye, and he looks over there toward the east, and he sees this craft coming into a dive and headed in their direction. There aren't any windows or propellers, no kind of propulsion mechanism. It doesn't look like a plane, but this plane, he said, was elliptical in shape. It was glowing orange, and it had a rounded sort of hump toward the center on both the top and the bottom end, to our uh, very much to our um, good fortune, uh, he also sketched what he saw. 1943. Now, to my way of thinking, what we're seeing right there looks like one of two things. <laughs> it, it certainly has the appearance of maybe some of the swept wing type stealth aircraft that we recognize today as seen in profile. Uh, but at very least superficially, it also resembles a classic flying saucer, does it not? 1943, over California. Now, for those who have said that the UFO phenomenon uh, began in 1947, and for those who have further argued that perhaps one interpretation of why the phenomenon begins around that time has to do with the idea that after the world exits the greatest conflict, global conflict in, in living memories, World War II, and we have brought nuclear weapons onto the battlefield. And that, again, has been this incredible uh, technological achievement, but also a, a horribly devastating one. Um, many, and again, the late, great Stanton Friedman, uh, who I, I counted as a friend, and I you know, got to hang out with him many times and have lunches and dinners and, and hang out at conferences and things with him over the years. Um, you know, Stanton, I think, had been very much of that mind. And again, Really, that makes all the sense in the world. He being a nuclear physicist and someone who had worked on developing nuclear propulsion systems and things like this, you know, for, you know, big companies that were involved in this. 
and someone who, of course, getting interested in UFOs and he's looking at this nuclear component, it no doubt would have made sense and still does to many today. Uh, add to that, of course, the work of Robert Hastings and many others who uh, strongly argue that, and I think that this is a very accurate argument, that the UFO technologies, uh, whatever the presence may indicate, it seems to indicate to us that they have taken great interest in nuclear facilities and our weapons systems and may also be capable of shutting those down, which is certainly something that should give us pause for uh, or cause for pause. But Again, it makes all the sense in the world that many researchers would say these things, the phenomena, the UFOs, were attracted by, you know, our dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and uh, or, or uh, Hiroshima rather and Nagasaki. You know, it, it was those incidents that put our, you know, our little world out there on the map, so to speak, and got a, you know eyes from elsewhere on us. But if we actually look deeper at the history, what we seem to find is indeed that there are reports. Uh, from prior to the Second World War, even prior to 1943, which is really right in that time frame. And that would still kind of work in terms with, of the model we're discussing here. But there are plenty that go back even earlier. Again, Charles Fort talked about super zeppelins and was talking about those in the early teens. We've got all kinds of other reports that were cataloged by the Fortean Society, which followed in his footsteps. Um, you know, there are fantastic historical perspectives that the researcher Lauren Gross wrote about in his Fourth Horseman of the Apocalypse series, which can be read, read online, I believe, at the Project Sign uh, historical project online that uh, Thomas Tullian and a number of other fantastic UFO researchers have contributed to over the years. And I highly re recommend that people read these. Yet again, bringing it all full circle. Why read all this oldy moldy stuff when we've got videos being released by the Pentagon that seem to show the best maybe representation of these things that we've ever seen? Well, I would argue if you want to understand what these things may be, as Barry Greenwood said, and as I quoted him saying at the outset, it really helps to know the history of the subject. And so a few general takeaways, and I've got a general uh, note uh structure I want to follow here. Uh, one, as we've already ad addressed, did UFOs really first appear in 1947? They may have the UFOs as we recognize, but I would think that a, a better, and, and, a, and a, it's certainly a different way of looking at things, but I do think it's also a better way perhaps of accounting for the apparent appearance of the phenomena during the Second World War era. What also happens during that period? Yes, of course, we have the innovation of new kinds of technology. And during the Second World War, we, of course, develop radar. The United States, Germany develops it. Canada also picks up the, the game and, and develops it fairly shortly thereafter. Uh, the UK had also developed it around the same time that the United States had. So after the Second World War and even during the Second World War, we all of a sudden had a nascent technological capability that when someone said that they saw something off in the distance, we could also now look at the scan and say, oh, wow, you know, we got a bleep here on the radar. There is actually apparently some object out there in the same direction as the light that we're looking at. And so what I would argue is that the, the advent of new technologies during that era may have aided us in perceiving technologically something that had perhaps been here longer, but which we were not as well equipped to observe. And I would, in fact, point out the very necessary corollary to that, that here in the modern era, Using the Raytheon's at FLIR forward targeting pod, the Navy seems to have been far more successful filming UFOs than other military or civilian groups have in past eras. So again, one might argue that it is the way that technology progresses over time that enables us to see more things in nature. There was a great uh, report that I touched on on my podcast the other day, the Micah Hanks program where astronomers are very excited about the fact that new developments in technology are allowing us to see uh, peculiar phenomena out there in space. And they were very surprised by the fact that they said, we thought that we would gather a bunch of data and then artificial intelligence. Machine learning would help us find phenomena that we hadn't expected to find. You know, within a few months after we actually implement the technology, we're already seeing with our own eyes things we hadn't expected to find and things which we can't fully explain. So I would ask, how many more times will the advent of new technologies broaden our awareness of nature and make more apparent to us things that may have been here all along, but which we simply weren't capable of sensing with the innate senses that we as humans possess? Again, we didn't know about a lot of the mysteries of the cosmos prior to the invention of the telescope. We didn't know about microbial life, right, prior to the invention of the microscope. Maybe 
the invention of radar helped us begin to put a finger on something that people have been talking about for decades, perhaps centuries. Yes. Maybe new technologies are taking us even further in that direction. And that's, I think, where we will uh, leave things in the context of history and UFOs for today. Well, thank you so much, Micah. Um, lots to digest there. And uh, as we've said on, uh, after previous lectures today, you know, it is a, a historical uh, understanding of these subjects that's all important uh, to move us forward and to not repeat the mistakes of the future and to try to come up with some new ideas uh, to help us understand these things. I'm afraid we don't have any time for uh, questions, but uh, thank you so much for, for everything you've done. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to having you on again and talking to you uh, again very, very soon. Uh, folks can go to all your websites, micahanks.com, uh, the, the debrief.org and, uh, the other is the seven, seven ages.org website. And, uh, of course they can go to anomalyarchives.org and see all the links there as well as links to your books. So thank you so much, Micah. You have a great day. Yeah. My pleasure. Hope to see you again soon. I will see ya. Bye. All right, folks, that's Micah Hanks and coming up very uh, quickly here is going to be Ed Conroy. So sit tight. <laughs>